I'm Rob LeCoury, your senior editor at Gold Derby here with David Escoya, co-creator and showrunner for Foundation. Now, David, Foundation chronicles this thousand year saga of the Foundation and this galactic empire in decline. You know, the, it's based on the renowned Asimov novels. And I would say it's probably the most ambitious sci-fi source material to wrangle into a series probably ever. Yeah. Um, you stuck the landing though. It seems that you stuck the landing and people are really happy with it. I'm interested to know what made you ultimately take the plunge and go on this journey, knowing that you could have so easily crashed and burned. <laughs> um, well, um, first of all, I, I was offered the opportunity to adapt Foundation twice before in my career, but twice before it was as a feature or a series of features. And I just didn't think it was possible to condense foundation into three hours or even three, you know, th three, three hour films. Um, so it wasn't until, and I, I have to credit uh, David and Dan and Game of, Game of Thrones, until Game of Thrones came out, that was the first really big, I would say novelistic adaptation um, of a serialized show. And it wasn't until that happened and then we had all these, the streaming wars where everyone was throwing their hat in the ring that I thought perhaps the medium had evolved to a place that it would be possible. So instead of trying to condense, we had the opportunity to expand. And people that have read the books know that particularly, particularly the first book, which is really um, six loosely connected short stories. A, a lot of big events happen off screen. The empire falls off screen, things like that. Uh, so the ability to expand instead of condense uh, was you know, one of the core attractions. And I think also at this point in my life, um, I've adapted a lot of um, big material, big properties. And I, I think I relish the challenge of it. And, and frankly, I would say the last reason is Asimov, uh, the foundation series of Sun, fundamentally, it's a message of hope, uh, faith in science, faith in humanity, faith in rationalism. I've been involved in a lot of really dark, uh, more nihilistic adaptations. And now that I'm a father of three, I thought, oh, God, I'd love to do something that isn't quite so unrelentingly dark. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. And, and then given that it's really taken off, it was probably worth the 80 year wait that we finally, we're just at the right place, right time for someone like yourself with Apple, you know, the budget and the appetite for a show like this. And it's like, once you get into it, it's, it is, it is very complicated. It, obviously the, not, the novels are so like sprawling and you've managed to kind of just kind of wrangle it in some way that we were able to follow it, which is, I think, you know, big congrats to you. Um, but you want to do it over a long period of time, don't you? You're in this for the long haul. Like you've said you want to do eight seasons. Is that is that that's a hugely risky proposition though? Yeah, I mean, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't it doesn't mean that we'll get there or that I won't flame out at some point, but you know, go big or go home. I I, I think uh, you know, this story is supposed to span a thousand years. Asimov himself didn't get to the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I think we have eight seasons worth of stories to tell and hopefully we'll get the opportunity to tell those stories. Uh, I know that I get at least 20 episodes now, so that's something we're a quarter of the way there. Um, but you know, uh, I, I will say it was a huge proposition for Apple and for Skydance, and they knew it was an enormous financial investment and an enormous investment for, for their platforms. And they wanted to know that I was writing towards something with my writers, that we weren't just vamping. So I at least had to give them some indication of where this whole thing might end, uh, which was fair enough. Yeah, it is. And um I'm, you know, I'm hugely excited for season two. Um, the, a real highlight of the show that most people I hear from talk about are the breathtaking visuals. Um, the production design and visual effects are unbelievable. And I just wonder as the showrunner and, and creator, what was the most exciting or perhaps terrifying aspect of this really expansive world building that you had to embark on? 
I would say there are two aspects. One is that because it's um, a far flung future, virtually nothing in the show could be bought off the rack. We have to manufacture everything. We had to come up with our own fonts. Um, and so that was just a, a design complication beyond anything I'd ever been involved in. Um, I would say the other aspect is that at a time, particularly for a lot of science fiction, when people are moving towards shows that are predominantly filmed on the green screen or in the volume, which is uh, um, the kind of light box that, that some of the other science fiction shows are, are filmed on, I wanted to go in the opposite direction. I wanted to film in six different countries and film on location and film with miniatures and go very old school to go David Lean and you know John Huston instead of the direction where everyone else was going. That was incredibly difficult to propose to Skydance and Apple initially. As I said, I, I literally want to go 180 degrees in the opposite direction from which you know big screen science fiction is going these days because I wanted it to feel more tactile. I mean, and obviously an incredible headache during COVID. But I do think that this show feels more visceral than, than some other shows. Um, I think a lot of people have talked about how immersive it is. And that's largely due to the fact that we did go to six different countries. We did build a lot. Um, most of those ships were built in miniature and done the old fashioned way. And I, I think you can tell um, certainly Certainly the cast and crew could feel the difference when we were, you know, out on a slope in Iceland or baking in the sun in the Canaries. Wow. It does feel very tactile and very immersive, I must say. That's a really huge factor, I think. Um, so I'm a big fan of cerebral thought-provoking sci-fi, character-driven. Um, having, having seen all of season one, one of my highlights absolutely was episode six, Death and the Maiden. That's where, for people who are watching Brother Days on the Maiden, um, it goes on this enthralling kind of vision quest of sorts. And then we learn more about Brother Dawn on Trantor um, as he pursues a romance with Azura. And of course, that leads to really kind of shocking and uh, unexpected twists and turns. So that was a stunning episode. I, I could watch that on many occasions. I'm wondering what you think. Um, are you too close to it? Or can you pinpoint a highlight from the season that you really loved and thought it just came out perfectly? I mean, to a certain degree, I'm too close to it. But um, I would say episode eight, which just dropped last Friday, is one of my favorite episodes. Um, I think that um, I don't want to spoil it for people that haven't seen it, but where we get to in the end, particularly in some of the scenes between Demerzel and Day, uh, was very exciting for me because um, I was hoping to get to sort of a deep emotional philosophical place, which maybe people weren't expecting. I'm also a big fan of episode three, which starts with this short film, kind of the butterfly life cycle of the dying Cleons. Um, for me, uh, the, you know, I, I, the, the spectacle and the scope are, are, are exciting and fun to do, but I'm, I'm hoping to move people as well and catch them off guard. And so I, I would say the beginning of three and the ending of eight, and without spoiling too much, is some of the stuff that's going to be dropping in the finale. Yeah, ex ex that's what I mean. Like, it's so expansive, and yet those really intimate character moments is really what hooked me in. And well, I, I was, I, yeah. What I said all the time to my cast, to my crew, to my actors, to Apple, the scope of the show is like massive. It's as big as a galaxy and as narrow as the human soul. And I don't want to do anything in between. I just want to be super tight and super intimate, or I want to go mind blowingly large. Yeah, and that's exactly what you get on the show. Um, one of the major highlights as well before we go is the um, the casting of the, the Cleons, the Emperors. Um, I came into the show with not knowing anything. I hadn't read the books. And seeing Brother Dawn, Brother Day, Brother D um, Dusk, all of whom are clones of Cleon. Um, so talk us through the casting of Lee Pace, Terrence Mann and Cassian Bol Bilton, because I um, you could say that you got lucky, but surely that's not <laughs> that easy. Yeah, it can't be that easy. Well, we did get lucky and it was also obviously a bit by design, but look, that aspect isn't in the books. That's an invention of ours. Um, right. The empire doesn't really have a face and we wanted some level of continuity from season to season. So we came up with that um, by necessity. Uh, uh, and, you know, we started with Lee Pace who 
you know, I have fantasy casting up in my writer's room and we had a picture of Louis Pace and we had a picture of Jared Harris. This never happens, but we actually got those two. And then having cast Lee as the anchor, we had to find a younger actor who could play a young Lee Pace and an older actor who could play an old Lee Pace. And we did some minor cosmetic things um, with the hairline and uh, their brow that were, and, and their teeth and their um, contact lenses. They're wearing a few things, but it, it's, it's, it's really just a kind of boot camp with those three guys spending a ton of time together with a movement coach um, and rehearsing their mannerisms together. And now it really is second nature. We spent, I don't know how many hours with the three of them trying to hone their mannerism, mannerisms and have them ape each other and read each other's lines. And I would say, I don't know, three times a week for you know at least a month, we did it before we started shooting with the three of them. Yeah, and it really, it's it's so effective the way they work together so well. On that note, thank you for your time today, David. We'll bring thank you back. You so much. Great. Shortly.